Welcome to Plato's Cave. I'm Jordan Myers, and I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. You're listening to a reading group episode of the show, which means that in this episode, I discuss political philosophy with two non-philosopher friends, Adam and Giffen, because philosophy shouldn't just be for philosophers. So with that introduction, please enjoy our discussion of political philosophy. As promised, uh, after the last episode, we are doing the Communist Manifesto or uh, the Manifesto of the Communist Party. So before we start, <laughs> Giffen, how are your shoulders feeling? My shoulders? Because I oh. think you're going to be doing a good bit of the lifting for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I will request a tunnel afterwards, but other than that, I'm good. I, I, <laughs> this podcast doesn't include health insurance. It's not a company, <laughs> company yet, so... Uh. I strange I, labor strikes again. <laughs> you know, I, I'll be prepared to be alienated from your own labor over the course of this episode. Yeah. I so I said that because I, you know, I think I kind of carried the brunt of the work last episode, but I do not think I'm going to be that role this time. Because honestly, I I think I understood this text a lot less, to be honest, than the previous really? one. Well. It's not that I understood it less, it's that I, maybe I have a lot more questions, and I don't know if those questions are indicative of me not understanding it, or if they're genuinely open questions. That's I, think it I think it depends though, right? Because like I, what I was going to say before we kind of dive into this was, <clears throat> I think parts one, two, and four are yes. all, you know, very good, but part three, I don't even want to touch on part three to be no, honest, because no. just, just for the listener's edification, um, part three is a critique of other models of socialism and social reform. At and the time. Yeah, at the time. At the, at, at at the, the time, part. exactly. And, and honestly, going through those, he, I didn't feel that, and I could be totally wrong about this, but I didn't feel like that he was very even-handed in explaining <laughs> what those ideas were and yeah. why they were wrong. So I felt it was more of just a straight up critique. So I never kind of knew it exactly. Okay, what are we critiquing exactly in no, each yeah. of these? It wasn't that clear. Absolutely. No, I have like notes in part three, but it's really the bulk of it's going to be like one and two. And then like the final page is just like a single page, I think. Right. Yeah. 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 So. I, no, I, I totally agree. I, I literally didn't have a single note from section three because I just, I honestly couldn't. It was too, it was like filled with jargon of like, factions at the time and, and it just it really seemed antiquated at this point yeah my only interesting like well we can get there perhaps but i made a note about like what was what it was in marx's view constituting social democracy or so mm -hmm. i thought that was an interesting kind of observation but other, other mm -hmm. than that like we can honestly skip it over it's it's really really aged was that was that the petty bourgeois section right there um, i honestly was, which was more of the uh, social de uh, democracy I don't, I had like a question mark in one of the places. I'm like, it sounds like he's critiquing social democracy, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I think, and then I they, think they, they later, yeah, they I later section, his, he, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think that was his critique of petty bourgeois socialism. I, I think that was it. It's, that sounds about right. Honestly, like the section three is the one I'm least concerned about. We, we um, just, okay, we're not, we're not gonna. Yeah, 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 anyway. <laughs> I'll, okay, uh, in, in way of introductory remarks, I mean, I'll tip my hat in the sense that again, Almost with a strange labor, I thought that Marx did a really a pretty overall decent job of identifying some gritty, some pretty grave problems. But then as soon as he turns to his kind of proposed solutions, he really starts to lose me there. And I don't know, he <clears throat> I mean, OK, I'll, I'll give just like a very, very brief summary, maybe, and then we can dig into it. And then also, I mean, if I get anything wrong with this. Let me know because yeah, this I actually might, be indicative. might have some clarifying comments. Um, okay. I was, I did feel much more at home with this um, than a strange labor. So I took him, I, honestly, I'm only going to talk about section one and two because those are like the main, you know, kind of proposals. So it, I took him in section one to be either bordering on or explicitly looking at all of history through a materialist reductionism. So he's kind of reducing all of history to what he calls class struggle and class struggle specifically over only materialistic things. So essentially wealth or property. Uh, 
And that that was one, that, um, well, I'll come back around to that later. But then he kind of also talks about, he has this very, um, it's like a very pragmatic way of looking at things. He you know says, you know, he's not going to lay out this kind of grand theory of things or talk about divine rights the way things like ontologically ought to be, right? But he's actually just going to do this task of understanding how we got here in order to diagnose what to do now and what the problems are with the current state. So he talks about how we kind of transitioned over history from the tribes of gatherers to a feudal system and then to manufacturing and to industrialization where specialization is increasing along each step. And he also seems to kind of think there's some internal and inherent contradiction to capitalism that will guarantee its downfall or demise. Uh, and that's when he moves in section two to kind of put forth the positive proposal, which, <clears throat> to be honest, this was part of the thing that I was confused about, because he said things that, at least if you look at the exact words he's saying, might kind of appear a little bit contradictory. Uh, but the vast majority of it centers around the abolition of private property and the equalization of people in society. Uh, so he kind of puts forth that positive proposal in large part by juxtaposing it to criticisms of communism. And that is, I mean, really where the meat of the, of the proposal ends. So that's by way of introduction. And then honestly, I, I think we can just jump into whatever parts we want to from here. Yeah. Sure. And, and just correct if I'm wrong, but I think he says that capitalism inevitably leads to the mm. abolition of capitalism yeah. because capitalism furthers the standing of the proletariat such that um, they are now able to cooperate and mm. um, I guess they're in a better position themselves now. Uh, I, I I think we should go to that section exactly to kind of get the logic for that. But hey, real quick, also we should mention mm. <clears throat> he wrote this in 1840. Was it seven? Seven. Yes. Yeah. So just just as a you know kind of no context is super then. important here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it, okay. We can it, honestly we can go ahead with with starting with that. I don't think we have to like try to do it chronologically. Do you, Do you know Adam where that was kind of in the pages page numbers uh, i do believe it was in part one <clears throat> but that sounds right but oh was it was it around i had it highlighted it was my one of my favorite quotes um <laughs> uh okay this i this might start to get at it on page 17 one two three four paragraphs down he says <clears throat> oh and we'll always we'll post the pdf as always um he says we see then the means of production and of exchange on whose foundation the bourgeoisie built itself up were generated in feudal society. At a certain stage in the development of these means of production and of exchange, the conditions under which feudal society produced and exchanged, the feudal organization of agriculture and manufacturing industry, in one word, the feudal relations of property became no longer compatible with the already developed productive forces. They became so many fetters. They had to be burst asunder. They were burst asunder. I, that's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, but actually what I know that what I just read is that's part of his kind of, isn't that part of his historical account of how we got to this problem? Yeah. Yes. yes. Well, can, can we talk about that first? Sure. Then, um, yeah, because the first like two pages are basically him laying out what he views as a kind of a history yeah. of, well, it, it basically is an introduction to like historical materialism. Yeah. Um, and, Which, Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, I'm not sure to what extent we want to critique this um, specifically. Well, I, I kind of had a lot of mixed thoughts about this um, because in, in one sense, um, I think he gets a lot right. With this, where obviously, I mean, he talks about the, you know, kind of at the root of uh, modernization is class struggle, right? Where he's, he kind of points out that there's, and this is obviously true if you just think about it, uh, there, is an, there is an incommensurable tension between the, uh, you know, pro producers 
of labor and the owners of of the means of production, right? Because if you're a factory owner or a business owner or whatever, you and this this goes back to the estranged labor. You know, you view people's labor as an input, and you want to pay them the least amount possible so that you can generate the most input. And if you're the reverse, if you're a worker, you want to obtain the highest wage possible because obviously that gives you a better life. And those, there's no way of reconciling those. Like it's always just going to be a, a compromise, but it's going to be a compromise that never actually, um, it's going to be a compromise that never actually satisfies either side. It's more of just like an indefinite stalemate until condi- conditions change, right? So I, I, I thought that that was pretty obviously true. But the part that I kind of was very, very skeptical of is that he looks at, uh, he seems to border on like a pure, uh, of like a purely reductionist view of history where he's saying everything, every political movement can be reduced to or analyzed in terms of capital or the ownership of production, stuff like that. And that, that honestly struck me as just obviously wrong. I mean, I was just thinking of examples and, you know, we, I've talked to you guys about like the Anabaptist movement and where that, you know, sect of uh, Lutherans, uh, you know, really, really polarized and, and went up into the north of Germany and they had that standoff and everything like pr- property was honestly not at the center of that movement. It was like religious beliefs. So I, I don't know if you're Marx, if you're analyzing everything through the lens of history that that does explain everything every given movement yeah Yeah, it's not really well i first but there's a lot of points there actually um i guess first i don't know that he necessarily says it's like fundamental to every movement i think it's he's saying like in terms of like the on a grand scale like Mm -hmm. entire like architecture of production like you can kind of trace a lot of um history through this observation like because mm-hmm. the you know the there's like this kind of feedback loop between like the productive forces and then the institutions that are erected around those and then you know whenever the production forces change you know you get feedback there um but he at least in this work and i think he actually does change his view a little bit after this um it's very like unilinear it's like he mm. he says like they're like we all started in the same place every there's one path and like it you know it goes through these stages and it ends in like communism right we're currently in <laughs> yeah. capitalism and the bourgeois revolution it was now this is like an interesting thing because it, i mean it's relevant to history i'm not sure how relevant to the conversation but his view at least at this time is basically you know the bourgeois revolution is necessary like 100 necessary you know feudalism then where we are now and then mm-hmm. communism right um there's no um there's no skipping the revolution, which is what the Russians would end up doing. Um, they basically jumped over the bourgeois revolution. So it's just an interesting observation, I guess, that even like later Marxists have a lot to have a lot of qualms with at least this version of Marx. Oh, also, and, and I, well, I, I do want to respond to your earlier point, though, Jordan. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think it's also important to note that when looking at it through like kind of a grand scale um, lens, Marx points out the fact that many great ideas or revelations that occur are from people that, you know, have the leisure and the capital in order to kind of um, to produce ideas when they're not toiling. Hmm. Right. So, so kind of going back to like your Anabaptist point, like the idea of like a rebirth in that sense would have come from someone who Hmm. wasn't, you know, a member of the proletariat that was toiling all day. It was someone mm. that came from more of like the bourgeois class, whether that's, you know, some sort of, <clears throat> you know, Da Vinci. Um, yeah. You yeah. know, or, you know, or, 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 or just somebody that um, whether they're part of, you know, the clerical movement mm. or they're part of the property class, those are, those are not toilers. Mm. You know, those are not people that are toiling in the field. So I think that's what he would argue. I don't know. But. Yeah, it, it was just weird. It was uh, it was honestly unclear to me whether he was saying like every political movement or like or any movement could be traced to that, or if he was just saying on a grand scale, it's like you know, 
I don't know. It's just, it seems to me that like many large movements can't obviously be tra- traced back to that. I mean, yeah. e- you know, like even, I don't know. I just, I, I think like if you look at even the discovery of the new world, right? Like if you look at the early explorers like Magellan or Columbus, any of these people, uh, it's obvious that the conquest of resources was a huge factor there, right? You couldn't tell the story without that. But telling the story in only those terms, it also seems to kind of leave something out. You know what I mean? I just didn't, I just didn't know if he was kind of doing that more purely reductionistic task. Yeah, I, I would focus less on like the idea of like all movements because I don't think that would be something mm-hmm. he would necessarily... Um, even at this time agree with it's, it's more of like, yeah, he identifies the scale in which he's talking, which is same, like the important scale, okay. um, yeah. societal transformation, and then kind of goes from there to explain it okay. in a historically reductionist kind of way. Yeah. And, and like I said, in that way, I don't think he's wrong. The yeah. interesting thing going just, I wanted to remark on what you said, Giffen, because it's, he actually almost has this like very weird teleological or Hegelian view of history where it's like, it mm. goes through <clears throat> these oscillations of necessary steps that then converge on communism as young. The, yeah. 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 No, young Marx especially was an idealistic Hegelian, like 100%. <laughs> And it's he, really interesting. He, that's like one, that. basically one third of his project is kind of like that German philosophy, um, which he and, railed against pretty hard in section three. It was funny. <laughs> yeah, no, like, yeah, he, you know, critiques, he has critiques, but um, he does kind of adopt that kind of mindset of like the grand arc of history kind of. Um, yeah. But so like, I, I don't know, maybe this will be um, helpful, but this is like a way I've heard like his project described, um, which it was informative and this uh, it was useful when reading this. It's that like Marx's project was combining German philosophy, English economics and French socialism. And through this, I think you can see all of those elements. We just, Oh Jordan, you just identified like the he- kind of Hegelian um, <laughs> influence that the, the um, I don't know. Like I've, I haven't read the wealth of nations, but I've, you know, mm. I'm well, relatively familiar with like Smith and he is like all over the place in this, um, in parts one and two, mm. um, like Adam Smith, <clears throat> his thinking is everywhere. Like it, it is a million percent clear reading this, especially whenever he talks about like the, um, uh, the changes in like production that he was like taking these ideas from Smith, um, okay. good ones and bad ones, in fact. Um, and then like the French <laughs> socialism part is obvious. What do, you, what do you mean good ones and bad ones? Didn't you hear Peterson say there's nothing good in the Communist <laughs> Manifesto? <laughs> I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I forgot to um, invoke uh, Peterson. That's my bad. I, I, I won't even say anything else about it. It's not even worth saying. <laughs> just, I, it's just our suffering. <laughs> I had a question about, uh, on page 16, mm-hmm. I had a question about what something meant. Uh, one, two, three three slash four four slash five paragraphs down the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production oh also if people don't know bourgeoisie are the kind of ownership class and the proletariat of the working class um so he says the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production okay i totally buy that right like that's that is like the core of capitalism is you always have to it's like the newest, newest thing, right? Like there's never not going to be a new iPhone or whatever, right? Okay. But then I didn't understand what he meant by the next uh, mm-hmm. sentence. Conservation of the old modes of production in unaltered form was, on the contrary, the first condition of existence for all earlier industrial classes. I, I just, I don't know why, but I, I didn't understand what to make of that. Because he's saying, okay, so conserving the old ways of doing things was was opposed to that the condition of existence for all earlier industrial class is he is he talking about craftsmen okay that is what he's talking about there yeah yeah yeah. do craftsmen really not try to improve on their craft they're like i i didn't i didn't really get that they do but but it would be um you would keep the you know you would learn from a master in this period of time right you know you would go be an apprentice where you would 
kind of learn traditions of producing whatever okay. that has been kind of constructed over, you know, or it's been formed over, you know, centuries at that point. Right. Yeah. But it's like, okay, in this period of, you know, maybe say iron production. Mm. Okay. Well out with the old craftsman way of doing it. Right? Like we have machines now. Mm. So, so mm. there were centuries of, um, practices that were kind of just thrown aside for mm. machines. Yeah. So, and to, to add on to that, um, what I think he's saying here is even a little bit further. Um, well, actually one I'll add on to like the um, previous mode of production. Imagine like the guild system. Basically that was meant to like benefit, you know, people in a particular trade, you know, one way of viewing that is like at the expense of like, you know, consumers or other parties involved. Right. So that's the way it was a very conservative in nature. Right. Um, but in addition, um, I think what he's saying here is actually like, not only are, have we kind of tossed aside the, the earlier um, like way of doing it in the current system, it kind of can't propagate with, with any new conservatism. It needs to like, mm. th- there can't be like the pre-existing parties can't just like kind of bunker down. It's in the nature of like the, the you know, the new mode of production to constantly kind of tear down whatever institutions are there, you know, and just find whatever is better, more efficient, right? Mm. Still within like the constraints of like the property um, relationship. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, it does. It's like it's different from all previous eras in that like it is it can't be conservative. There's always going to be, you know, destruction, you know, creative destruction or, you know, whatever terminology you want to add there. I think we should read that little section because that's one of the best um, written you know, parts of this entire paper. But uh, mm. all fixed, fast frozen relations with their train of ancient and venerable prejudices and opinions are swept away. All new formed ones become antiquated before they can ossify. All that is solid melts into mm. air. All that is holy is profane. And man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. So, I don't know. I enjoyed how that was written because I, oh. I, 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 I did get what he was saying in the sense that, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't want to read into this too much and kind of like, <clears throat> you know, make up some conception that Marx wasn't going for. But I do think that this paragraph at the very least kind of prompted me to think about, you know, what it would be like, you know, to like learn a trade to, you know, like learn from like, you know, a craftsman to develop your own craft. And now, now compare that to just like working in a factory, you know, and I mean, where it's, it's back like, to a strange labor point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Where it's like, uh, you know, these are, just valued practices that were essential, but mm. no more, no more. Now there is, you know, what is the best machinery? Mm. What is the best? Um, and even, and before it, it may, maybe once you learn how to use that machine properly, there's a new machine mm. and, there's, and you're part of the machine. I mean, you, you're like, you're just essentially a machine. Yeah. You're yeah. just like the machines upkeep machine or what, you know? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So, that makes sense. That, that, that makes sense. Cause I, I just, I, I wasn't exactly sure what he was going for there. And I guess, I mean, after that, he talks about how, you know, the, it's the next sentence, the need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the entire surface of the globe. It mm. must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. And I really liked that too, because I mean, that just seems like a very, <laughs> I don't so, know how you can argue at that point. No, the, 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 what I find amusing here is that this point is just straight from Smith. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. Like, I, we can talk about it afterwards, but, like, like the best, like, the clearest, like, observations of, like, the developing economy are just ripped straight from Adam Smith, straight from the wealth of nations. Like, the observation of, like, the kind of um, uh, labor being, uh, you know, shifting from, like, uh, you know, groups like guilds or, you know, tradesmen doing things. So like within a factory, you have like the division of labor, like that's Smith here, like the, the kind of necessitation of like expanding markets, that's Smith. So like, it, it's, I mean, it's acute, it's great, but it's, it's not really Marx. It's Marx having read Smith and then writing it down. 
Just nice. another, I thought it would be useful because I, I have yeah, marked every, everywhere I have like, this is straight from Adam Smith. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll find the, we'll be able to identify the parts um, where Marx contributes, you know, not just like regurgitating Smith. Um, but I, I just call, wanted to comment on that last paragraph. Like, this was so much better written, in my opinion. It's like, it, it invo- invokes, like, I don't know if this was actually Angle's influence or if it was just, I think Marx it was Angle's it was be, influence. Yeah. I don't, I mean, maybe it was just like Marx intended to publish it. Like, they were contracted to write this. Um, it's worth mentioning, but it was, it reads really, really well. And it, it really has some incredible, like, poetic lines in it. Like, it's, it's really a good read. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, they had to be burst asunder. They were burst asunder. All that. that is solid melts into air. I mean, it's all beautiful. It's like <laughs> yeah. it really is. That Regardless really, of, you know, great writing. Yeah, no, no. But yeah, anyways. And, and I think that kind of bleeds into the next paragraph, which I like too, mm. um, where he says, like, to the great chagrin of reactionists, you know, it being capitalism in the sense, has drawn from under the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. All old established national industries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed. And like, we still see that today, right? Mm. Like, like in the sense that, you know, I mean, I, I know it's still kind of like a recent industry, but I mean, just consider like uh, coal mining, mm. you know, like in West Virginia or whatever. Great example. Just it, where it's just like, you know, it's been supplanted to natural gas because natural gas is cheaper. Hmm. it's cheaper so it's like and that necessarily isn't like a bad thing of course but at the same time it's just this this mode of economic production here what's like it you know um kind of you know spreads its tendrils to every corner of the earth yeah if you aren't as productive or as efficient as the most efficient and productive thing, you get around. burst asunder. <laughs> yeah, you're you're out. You will be. You're out. Yeah, yeah. So, well, this was actually. I thought that there was kind of a, a neat point that he almost failed to make, which is, I mean, he could do, like, he really could do the reverse side of the historical materialist materialist reductionism and just point out that the problem with capitalism is that everything has to get reduced into this one metric money just just profit or loss right and like i don't know about you guys but to like i have seen that you like you do see that in industry now like anything that gets proposed in your job it's just like oh, does it make dollars and cents or does it not like that that's the only metric that things get weighed on like even um like uh i i heard this like one talk by this um uh, like an, like, I don't remember what position he had at like an insurance company, or I'm sorry, not not an insurance company, a a, a car manufacturing company, and he was like, no, 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 you guys don't understand. When we decide to call for make a recall or not, we literally factor in the cost of the lawsuits for people losing their lives, and if it's less than the cost of recall, we don't do it. It's just like, oh holy yeah, shit. I, mean, I had the benefit of like an economics background. So this is like, this is super like well established in my mind. It, yeah. It's one hundred percent true. It nothing. I mean, this again. It's just like it goes back to the estranged labor point. But nothing is done for its own sake anymore. Like yeah, everything even, is instrumental. Yeah, even like the the really positive things you can imagine. There's calculations underlying them. Like they there has to be, or else they'll be burst of thunder. Like <laughs> you know, like. You can imagine, like, even like a super benevolent act regarding, like, didn't I talk about this last or something? Time? Like, something yeah. super, like, yeah, like it will simply, yeah, like, if it happens to coincide with something that's beneficial to you, it's not because they were trying to, like, max it was, it was, pro- it was, it yep. coincided with profit maximization. That, like, that is the yep. reason. Did we and, talk you know, about this in the Bertrand Russell uh, episode where it was like, it was just, dis- it was discovered that, uh, that that a coffee break actually increased productivity so people were given a coffee break and they were like oh this is so no so nice or whatever that we get like a five minute coffee break but it's actually it's not for them it's to increase yeah. productivity no, yeah. i have another good a great example so um i you know everyone knows henry ford but did you know that like he famously like raised yeah. like the wage to five dollars yeah. like you know an hour which was absurd at the time it was again not benevolence he said you know, well, I will create a class that will be able to purchase my vehicles that I'm like they're producing. It's like yeah. it, it is self interested, you know. Yeah. You know, you can, there's clearly some trade offs going on, you know, positives and negatives with that. But it is, 
it underlies everything simply everything yeah that 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 was i mean there were shades of that kind of mixed into uh to like all of page 16 but that that was one thing that i did actually think he hit the nail on the head on uh was on just that seven, oh, oh yeah yeah on. go ahead well i was just gonna say on page 17 like we want to kind of move on a little bit mm -hmm. um i i just wonder what we think of this idea here where i think uh it's i don't know how i feel about it but he's talking about the centralization of political power due to a kind of uh, materialistic view of mm -hmm. the world where he says, I'll, I'm going to read on the uh, second paragraph of mm -hmm. page 17. So the bourgeoisie keeps more and more doing away with the scattered state of the population of the means of production and of property. It has a agglomerated population, centralized the means of production and has concentrated property in a few hands. Okay. I agree with that. For the most part. Yeah. The necessary consequence of this was political centralization, independent or but loosely connected provinces with separate interests, laws, governments, and systems of taxation became lumped together into one nation with one government, one code of laws, one national class interest, one frontier, and one customs tariff. I don't, I don't know if I, I mean, do Just we think that's, that's true? There's one very banal interpretation in which it does seem true, which is like if you just so he's kind of pointing to the fact that like he, he's pointing to the fact that these means of production act as almost vacuum cleaners for the resources around, including people. Right. You know, the factory gets more and more efficient, more people work at the factory, they produce more goods. It's just kind of that, you know, so it, it seems parsimonious with that to assume that. As those kind, and then you can imagine, you know, kind of companies forming pacts with each other and everything. It, in that sense, it almost does seem to go hand in hand with the point he was making about how the, you know, the fingers of capitalism reach all over the world. And not in the sense that it is all over the world, but in the sense that uh, if you just, I don't know, because it, it it, it does seem parsimonious with what he points out, out about how tribes of gatherers kind of united and formed small towns and then those towns united and formed small cities, right? And then the cities became city states and city states become states and countries and everything. I, I don't know. It, that's like a very, very materialistic reading of that, but it doesn't seem wrong. Yeah. Um, it was clearly, I mean, it's, you know, pulled from observations about like the you know specialization or division of labor um like urbanization is a natural consequence of kind of like the changing the shift in mode of production that seems you know logical to me the political aspect does seem relevant either in the fact that whenever you have like kind of lowly populated like spread out communities whenever they're you know being pulled towards like city center because that's kind of yeah. the the you know incentive system that's constructed then yeah. you kind of have the unifications like that also seems natural um i don't know whether he's trying to make the claim that kind of like this simply goes on forever until you know communism you know i think he kind yeah. of is like it seems like a kind of a wink at that like you know he's showing the arc without without like you know comprehending or grasping with the idea of maybe diminishing returns to that you know at some scale um it's i don't know if you kind of we're sure but like overall it's like yeah that makes sense like i i kind of oh and lastly it's like the the capacity because he makes a i think this was a previous claim he makes the point that governments are kind of oriented towards like the goals of like the um the bourgeois class then like the idea of the centralized government allows for further developments um that like for you know the you know to the benefit of the bourgeois class that otherwise would be insurmountable, you know, like yeah. just centralization of things could like help coordinate railroads, like right, where you have otherwise massive coordination problems, governments are an instrument to solve that for the bourgeois class. And all of that seems to fit together. You know, it's just mm -hmm. a matter of like the magnitude of his claim where you could find fault. Right. Cause he does seem to kind of be pointing to an arc, the very unilinear course of history. At least it's kind of subtext for me. I just thought about it right now when you were talking, Giffen, in the in the converse side. Like, if you just ask, what incentive does a, you know, just a, a craftsman have to kind of unite with people far away? Like, none, really. He just, you know, 
uh, just cares about his kind of local market in that sense, right? But the more you do kind of industrialize, then it it kind of very naturally does look more and more like you want to kind of unite and create trade clauses and everything. And that that seems like almost a ground swelling or like a bootstrapping of government in a way. Yeah. And I, I'm going to be making a lot of points and hopefully not repetitive points, but another kind of angle here is just the idea of that previous mode of production, like these kind of what we're not talking about peasants basically ever with Marx. We're talking about like, you know, the, the previous producers, which were like tradesmen. Right. Um, so like industrial production and he, he pulls again from Smith and kind of observes, like you were saying with that incentive structure, um, basically the, they had in the old system mon- local monopolies on their production, right? So there was no incentive to like broaden the market and then you face competition, right? Mm-hmm. But because of like the, the kind of new you know, capitalism, he doesn't use the word capitalism because it hasn't been developed, but you can just kind of shorthand capitalism. It, um, it kind of forces the market broadening, which forces this coming together, which forces like the political consequences. Um, that's another mm-hmm. angle. This is the idea of like kind of the previous labor local monopoly. I thought I'd introduce again. I'm pulling out all this stuff from basically Smith. Yeah. Yeah. I I think I buy everything you said there. I think it just kind of comes back to an idea Jordan brought up earlier where it's like, okay, like I understand why what you just laid out can lead to the centralization of power, which Mm -hmm. then leads to the centralization of, you know, uh, or the political centralization, but it's almost like, okay, there are many other reasons it's not the why, whole you get, story. why you get political centralization, but you can understand why the concentration of capital among individuals can lead to political centralization. So, yeah, I mean, I actually kind of, maybe it's just my economics background, but it, I kind of do lean towards the view that like, not that it's inevitable, but it is a pretty strong force, like a very strong force. Would you agree with this? It, it's not the only... I wonder if I wonder if this kind of could sum up Marx. It's not it's not that centralized government was kind of the natural. Let me, let me rephrase it. I wonder if okay. I wonder if this would be true. Uh, uh, centralized government. The, the reason for it is not this industrialization, but it wouldn't have happened without it. Some something like that. Like it's not the whole story but it is a necessary condition for it to happen. I'm sorry, which is a necessary condition for the other? Um, which, what are the, what's the, the direction of your claim? The, I'm wondering if like the industrialization and specialization of everything that Marx is talking about under mm-hmm. capitalism is a requirement for centralized government, but it doesn't tell the whole story of why it occurs. I think uh, you say kind of the opposite though, right? Yeah, that's what I was trying yeah, to get at. Because okay. you can yeah, imagine cause... previous like political institutions, just like monarchy, like you can, you know, pretty centralized. You know, to some some degree, maybe you not think with the to production would happen without. I guess it just depends on what scale. But like, wh- why? What? I don't know. What incentive would a bunch of like, if you just look go like way back, you know, just a bunch of tribes in like the Middle East, right? Mm-hmm. What reason would they have to band together besides warfare. warfare? Right? Wouldn't it be warfare over resources? No, it could be. I mean, that's it, true. It could, I guess it, it could, could be different. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, no, I buy that. How- or religion, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. So there, there is other reasons why, but okay. I think I, I think I do sort of buy his idea that, yeah. you know, the concentration of property among individuals does lead to the central or, or political centralization. Yes. I think yes. I, I think I buy it going that direction. So, okay. and especially for you know, from Marx's perspective, where you had like, I mean, Giffen, you would know this better than me, but. I mean, how many different princes did you have, like, in the Holy Roman Empire? Right? Oh, yeah, so you, no. You had, like, worth 50 it. some, like, so it's, like... It's, it's actually very, very well-timed, because I don't want to get too bogged down too much in the history, but this was in 1847, this was written. In 1848, Europe, continental Europe, exploded into, like, the revolutions of 1848, um, and kind of key um, coalitions that were developed were, like that were super critical is kind of like the unification of like the German peoples, which didn't quite get off the ground yet um, fully. And then the unification of Italy, which didn't get fully off the ground yet. So like, this is he, this is kind of what he's observing, like, and it'll, it almost basically does come to pass at some point. All right. He identifies like, you know, he can look to Italy and say, well, there are some forces at work here and like some tensions building, you know, amongst these like random 
principalities or in Germany, et cetera. Um, and they're, the forces are, you know, providing a lot of tension towards centralization. So it's very, I don't want to say that the only place he drew this from, but like it makes sense for the time. Yeah. Considering he's like positioned. I don't know. Where did he write this? Did he write this one in London? I th- want to say London, but I'm not 100% I th- I think, sure. I th- but, that sounds right. Yeah, I, th- I think he did. Um, but I guess he had maybe just moved to London. So he would have been in Germany. So, or I guess not. Germany wasn't unified at that point. Yeah, so right. he, 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 one of the so, three so he, states. Yeah. yeah, so he, so he yeah. was there. Yeah. Yeah, he was very aware of what was going on in continental Europe. Yeah. Uh, okay, do we want to talk about the that inherent contradiction? Because this was something that I wanted to talk about in terms of the modern day, right? Um, uh, so he 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 almost talks about and like I don't know there there are quotes uh, that I could give. So throw, on page, throw us a quote, yeah. Uh, toss us a quote, yeah. Page, toss us a quote to kind of bite on here. Page nineteen, second paragraph. <laughs> But with the development of industry, the proletariat not only increases in number, it becomes concentrated in greater masses. Its strength grows and it feels that strength more. The various interests and conditions of life within the ranks of the proletariat are more and more equalized in proportion as machinery obliterates all distinctions of labor and nearly everywhere reduces wages to the same low level. Okay, so that's like kind of his stage one of the downfall where the problem is, is that you know, the proletariat, not only he's, he's saying you need more and more workers, obviously, and the wealth is being con- concentrated in few and fewer hands. Uh, it also becomes concentrated both in, I think he would say, uh, like geographical location because of the centralization, but also in terms of similarity of living standards, right? So you can kind of relate to people more easily, right? So it's actually this backhanded way in which uh, the proletariat is increasing as in power and in concentration as they become more useful for uh, the bourgeoisie. So then at the bottom of that page, he talks about another uh, kind of development. He says, finally, in times when the class struggles nears the decisive hour, the progress of dissolution going on within the ruling class, in fact, within the whole range of old society, assumes such a violent, excuse me, assumes such a violent, glaring character that a small section of the ruling class cuts itself adrift and joins the revolutionary class, the class that holds the future in its hands. Just as, therefore, at an earlier period, a section of the nobility went over to the bourgeoisie, so now a portion of the bourgeois, bourgeois, bourgeoisie goes over to the proletariat and in particular a portion of the bourgeois ideologists who have raised themselves to the level of comprehending theoretically the historical movement as a whole um so he's kind of talking about how like people begin to jump ship almost uh seeing that growing swell of of the proletariat and ah I don't know this. Do, do we actually see that happening? Like, ha- have we seen that happening? I, I don't know that. What the movement from bourgeois to proletariat? Yeah, I, I don't know that I agree with that because I was thinking of people like Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein almost, right? Like people who have are clearly elites, but who align with like, you know, kind of the working class in a large sense of the fact that, you know, it's the right wing working class that they align with. Right. And that's kind of their fan base, but they're not actually joining them. They're, they're kind of using them as means of production and just ad revenue and book sales or whatever. Right. Like, I I don't know. Yes. So I guess the, I think the claim is less about like that. It's inevitable that, you know, you, everyone becomes proletariat at some point. It's more like the, the forces are, of such a degree that like unsuccessful bourgeois yeah. will, you know, fall into proletarianism because they, well, I don't think it's they no longer, because what? if you're unsuccessful at, at becoming bourgeois, then you just are proletariat. No, I no, think I have no to if like, you are already bourgeois and then you fail at 
continuing to be because of the you know competitive forces. I didn't think he was saying that though, because then you're not like jumping ship. You're kind of like falling out of favor with the bourgeoisie. I, I well, you, a- you fall out of the class because you lose your property is more like. So that's what he's saying. I think that's what he's saying. Basically, also, like because the forces people okay. out of like the bourgeois, like it, you know, it's very turbulent as he was saying okay. in this page. If that's Therefore, what he's saying, it, like it agree. builds the proletariat necessarily because even like even people who are in the you know ruling okay. class will be forced out because of you know all these forces. Oh, I think that's what. So he's that's saying. what. Okay, okay. He's basically saying it's it's continuing to grow even from previous rulers because they, thought, people fall in. Oh, okay. I thought I'd be wrong. If you find that, a line that contradicts that, please let me know. No, it was just how I interpreted that line because I I thought that he was saying it's like, you know, like the class struggle nears the decisive hour. Like I, I thought he was saying that some per- per- bourgeois people will see that the proletariat are kind of growing in number and then join them like like voluntarily kind of change sides almost instead of suppressing them to join them I think well, he, 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 he does say point. that too he, well he says that too right there where he says that you know it there are going to be intellectuals that see kind of like in this hegelian way that you guys were describing that you know the ultimate end is communism mm. so they recognize that fact they understand the arc of history and they kind of just um will they, join the side of kind of the inevitability in that sense. they try to time the market <laughs> well, well so, so by that's, the dip that's, yeah that's one side but then the other one that you guys were kind of talking about i i i kind of interpreted that almost as like as giffen was describing where you could imagine what about like kind of like a wealthy shopkeep here like where we live right mm-hmm. but what if like you know they they employ maybe you know 30 to 40 individuals Mm-hmm. They might be considered part of like the bourgeoisie at that point, but say Walmart arrives. So not now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. Walmart arrives. They get displaced. Now they're part of the, uh, the Importantly, they lose yeah. all their capital, right? Like they'll mm-hmm. just be bought out or just driven out. They can't pay rent anymore. Like they, mm-hmm. by definition, like they are no longer, you know, a member of the ruling class. Mm-hmm. I, I especially liked the, um, I, I thought it was even more accurate for like the lower middle class that he was describing where it's yes. like, I, I, I especially felt that one today where it's like um, there are a lot of, you know, we can, there's so many examples we can choose, like say like a truck driver, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to imply that truck drivers are lower middle class because they can make you know quite a good wage, but, but let's just say that, you know, you are a truck driver, like at the lower middle class, right. Where, you know, you do in this case, um, your job is threatened by market forces in the sense that you might, you could get displaced automated, by automation, yeah, yeah. right? So in that sense, like someone in that position might recognize that like their position is pretty tenuous, right? Like they're kind of hanging on by a thread. So they might, even though they're not part of the proletariat say, they might defect into the proletariat because they recognize that, or they might defect into proletariat interests because they recognize that they will soon, you know, be joining that class potentially. Mm. so which is always yeah. interesting so yeah exactly i think that's exactly the kind of thing i was trying to point out it's like the people will f- see that even if you're in a good position you're not in a good position mm. right. so sorry i'm just looking at my notes here um uh, okay so okay okay so we have those two points on the table he adds that people will be i mean there's this like increasing stratification right where like the 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 wealthy control more and more and more and he almost talks about how they're like this seemed to be at the heart of the contradiction where they're driving themselves out of business almost because people don't have the money due to lower and lower wages to actually buy the goods they're producing like the model Mm -hmm. t uh example with henry ford yeah 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 So then on page 21, I'll just read like the rest of it. He says, it is unfit to rule Uh, it, I think being capitalism there again. Uh, Capitalism is unfit to rule because it is incompetent to assure an existence to its slave within its slavery, because it cannot help letting him sink into such a state that it has to be fed him instead of being fed by him. Society can no no longer live under the bourgeoisie. In other words, its existence is no longer compatible with society. The essential conditions for the existence and for the sway 
of the bourgeois class is the formation and augmentation of capital. The condition of capital is wage labor. Wage labor rests exclusively on competition between laborers. The advance of industry, whose involuntary promoter is the bourgeoisie, replaces the isolation of the laborers due to competition by the revolutionary combination due to association. The development of modern industry, therefore, cuts from under its feet the very foundation on which bourgeois produces and appropriates products. What the bourgeois therefore produces above all are its own grave diggers. Its fall and the victory of the proletariat are equally inevitable. Okay. Hmm. This is this is very interesting to me. Um yeah, this is this is a huge point. It's like capitalism yeah. sows the seeds for its own demise, right? For its own demise. Because exactly. it essentially he's pointing out the fact, like just to condense all of that, hmm. he's pointing out the fact that capitalism relies on this kind of endless churning of resources and production of goods and and services and everything. And to do that, you have to continually drive down wages to get lower prices so that people will buy it and everything. You just have to keep, it's like, it's like a Ponzi scheme almost. You just have to like keep it running, you know, but he points out that just like, almost by the laws of physics that can't continue indefinitely. Like you just can't. No. Yeah. It's just, Oh no, exactly. You're no, going to hit some wall at some point. That was a better analogy. Even than you might realize because he, I think he actually viewed himself as the Newton, you know, of, <laughs> of like, that's interesting economy. Yeah. You know, like he literally thought he saw like the world just like flowing through his mind, <laughs> like, like Marx and Engels, like they, you know, what, what Darwin did to biology, like, this was going to do to like, you know, historical economy or whatever terminology you want to phrase it as the world, whatever scope. So my question is like, especially in this earlier stage where it was unilinear. Mm -hmm. Here's my, here's my question. He seems incontrovertibly right about oscillations within capitalism, right? Like look at the 2008 market crash. That is just Mm. a perfect example. It was just this like churning of, of real estate and just loans for real estate. And they didn't have any more good loans and they bundled these like packages of poor loans and rebranded them as, it was just, it was pure madness, right? And it was all driven by just this, just we gotta have the stocks up. So it was just all a Ponzi scheme, right? Line goes up. But I hear, I don't know, like this was written in 1847 and it's 2022 mm. and there's a lot of capitalist countries, like the vast majority are at least either capitalist or, you know, very capitalist in, in. Yeah. I mean, are there any, aspects. are there any like r- non-nominally communistic powers left? And, and, and that was the other like side of uh, my <laughs> question is like communism hasn't worked like, yes. So, so I might be able to. Well, I, I kind of want to throw an idea, an idea yeah. first to see if you guys uh, kind of got this impression too. But do you get the, do you get the sense like in this paper that Marx thinks there's like a finite amount of wealth? Like I like yes. let me read like let me read you this quote here. Yeah, please kind pull of, it up to, to back up. It's, it's page. on page twenty. Final quote. I mean, final paragraph. He says. <laughs> The modern labor, on the contrary, instead of rising with the process of industry, Mm. sinks deeper and deeper below the conditions of existence of his own class. He becomes a pauper, and (laughs) pauperism develops more rapidly than population and wealth. Uh, I don't know about that. So, like, it it almost seems like he's saying, like, you know, considering, like, wealth is, like, among just a few hands – the idea that wealth is going to, you know, further and further increase, you know, in his mind, I, I could be wrong here, but it just seems like, you know, more and more people in his mind, if there's a finite amount of wealth, become paupers. And the idea of people gaining wealth, um, there's the rate at which people are gaining wealth diminishes because there's less wealth to go around. I, I don't I do know. Well, so I, so it, I don't it, think he... I, there's Wait, before you interpret. disagree before you disagree can because i yeah. want to hear if you're about to disagree with what i'm saying but i want to put it out there so that you can oh, do it for sure yeah okay it's all so when i read that i thought it's almost as if he failed to predict that generally speaking skills could keep up with the pace that we lose resources at so it's like yeah we're, we're kind of 
there's not an infinite amount of resources, but the ways in which we can manipulate the amounts we have is kind of keeping up with uh, the rate at which we're just churning through it in a sense that like he almost seemed to, he, he seemed to not get that we could keep conditions pretty bad, but not bad enough so that that, that floor would always kind of creep up just as a byproduct of all of this innovation. And I wonder if that's why we actually haven't seen his prophecy come to fruition. So I don't know if that was included in what you were going to rebut Giffen or not. Uh, a little, I know I was, okay, I was okay. going to address something a little bit slightly different. We can still talk about that though. Um, so the point, like the quote, um, Adam, that you read was about, you were, I had a question about whether he kind of viewed wealth as kind of like, you know, finite. And then it's like, he's making a comment about like, it's simply going, you know, more and more to this group. Right. Which leaves you obviously in a pauper, like impoverished <laughs> state. Um, I think and he, he's not very clear, but Maybe this is a generous view, but I think he's saying he's observing a relative, right? It's a um, inequality that's developing, not necessarily like an absolute decrease, right? Like the wealth is continuing to increase, but the proportion which goes um, to like the yeah. less desirable classes is, is shrinking, right? It, it's the idea that... Which that's um, true, historically speaking, right? Yeah. Oh, no, this is basically what Henry George would point out in describing like the coincidence of progress and poverty right it's like this growing inequality this wealth gap not necessarily like there's a finite amount of wealth right because i, th I, th okay. I think if, if he read his smith properly which he sometimes did um he'd probably recognize that like one of his critiques of previous you know political economists was that they viewed wealth as being finite right don't let gold mm. leave the country that the keep the gold in the country even though that was terrible to trade you know, think like that <laughs> yeah it's yeah, ridiculous. Like, you know, <laughs> mercantilism. So I don't know if that answered your question, Adam. And I definitely know it didn't really address your point, Jordan. <laughs> Apologies. They were different. I didn't know if yours was just going to hit on it. It didn't. That, okay. No, what I, you said but, actually but I makes sense I to Adam. I definitely agree with Jordan, though. Like, on, like, in the sense that, like, he definitely didn't predict what was going to happen in that sense. No. That, yeah. So you know, that, that living standards, wrong, yeah. Yeah. you know, would, would improve in such a way that, you know, to say that pauperism is developing more rapidly than, than wealth, I, or, or that it, that pauperism, I guess, I guess that is what he says, pauperism develops yeah. more rapidly yeah. than wealth. It's like, yeah, can we really say that happened? No, no, no. It's like relative <laughs> pauperism did, but not pauperism. Absolutely. Because yeah. like yeah. at this point, like 30 years from now, like, you know, you start to enter the Gilded Age, right? That's mm -hmm. like the kind of most famous example of like the inequality, right? But wealth is developing, you know, like, pauperism is relative right we still drag people up they're just way farther than like the people in the head right and um i'm gonna make another kind of broad point about like my you know my previous knowledge about marcus claims is that like kind of his he well i don't know if you guys like had a pre um conceived notion of this but marx very like obviously states that like the bourgeois is like the most productive class of all time like ridiculously and his project mm -hmm. was basically to say we're going to keep or expand that productivity without the kind of like moral, like morally atrocious nature. Yeah. And kind of that link is where it's like, he's, this is where he kind of pulls his Hegelianism and kind of his like kind of skewed observations. And he's like, the arc will get there. But I mean, from our frame of reference, it's more like, well, we have 150 years of knowledge and it's like, it's a trade-off really that that's the kind of situation we're in. Right. It's like yeah. the Soviets were importing technology, like, 30 years after like the US yeah. started all it's like no yeah. no 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 <laughs> like, yeah you, you, they, we haven't quite got there yet you know what i actually just realized M marx is actually kind of an accelerationist he he actually <laughs> wants things to get so bad he, isn't that kind of at the root of his theory the it, it, he expected it and like no I acceleration is definitely entailed by it isn't it because i don't it, know if it's strictly entailed we could get I, that. I kind of thought it was because on his view it's like the People, pauperism is like a necessary condition. It's not even like an incidental one. You actually almost have to like drive people into pauperism <laughs> such that they, because here's why I think this actually goes back to the point <laughs> I was saying. I think the reason why we haven't seen this prophecy come to fruition is because we actually, 
we actually can't in this society drive people that low in large enough numbers because what he failed to see is that like our what i said before our skills are keeping up at like a very kind of neck and neck pace with the pauperism <laughs> so so it's like because the relative pauperism is 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 just blowing up right i mean just what it's like uh 50 of the wealth is owned by one percent of the population in the united states it's something like that right yeah sure um, whatever it is it's it's if it's not that it's very close. I'm not off by more than a few percentage points. Uh, it, it honestly could be less than one percent. I think it, like, it, might, it might be like point one percent. Okay, okay. So, yeah. so I'm definitely not off by more than a percent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so well, uh, I don't know. It, it's almost like what he failed to see is that people can get. I, I, I think he failed to see the extent to which people can become sedated, almost like. <sighs> you know, are you really going to throw off the reins of production if you can kind of come home to like, you know, it's like a shitty apartment, but it's like an apartment and, you know, you've got like an Xbox or whatever, right? And you're just gonna like, you're gonna like order Chinese food and you don't have anything in your savings, but that's kind of a problem for later on, right? And like, yeah, yeah, I don't know. So this might be a case, like actually good evidence, Jordan, that like, in the paragraph we were just talking about, maybe he actually did view it. Like I think that. he is an accelerationist. Oh, well, I was going to talk about like the point about like oh, absolute oh. wealth versus um, yeah. like relative wealth. Yeah. But like, I, I he would definitely have he would feel the pull towards accelerationism because it would prove him right. <laughs> like, I don't know. That I he, think it's a necessary. He, he thought it was so. natural. I don't know if he would like say we have to keep like impoverishing people. That would be like the accelerationist thing, right? Like, let us you know go towards this so that we can you know emancipate ourselves later. Um, but he, in line with like what he failed to see, um, he actually mentions it because he mentions like in England, like the um, the series of acts from like the 1830s, right? That were like kind of um, the 10 hour day, right? Like, thing, yeah, the 10 hour day yeah. was a series of events, but that was like, yeah. that was the thank you. Like, it, they're basically reforms, right? Yeah. Um, and in, I mean, so in a sense, like he was spot on because he's writing, writing in 1847 and in 1848 revolution to explode across Europe. Right. Mm. But in another sense, we don't even really learn about the revolutions of 1848 because the Anglosphere wasn't affected by it. England had reformed the system. And so there was not the pressure to re- like for like large scale revolution. You know, reformed it to what? Just, just kind of, they oh, just kind of t- oh. dialed back the exploitation? Yeah, like, so like the, the worst excesses of capitalism were like addressed Okay. within the legislature which kind of like lowers like the sure. you know the, the pacified energy, people right exactly because yeah. and yeah. this was you know in part because england was developing first right mm. they went through the arc earlier and like if, if marx was a little bit more observant he would see that like you actually can you can actually like develop a system where you kind of like can address the the worst aspect of capitalism but keep the productive power in a world where you can't really get like both right if you view it as a trade-off and not like the grand arc of history yeah. like it it was self-regulating in that sense like mm. there there was no like inevitable explosion and he would have been able to see that if he saw that england you know the next year didn't <laughs> explode into revolution right it was continental europe who developed after it wasn't as far along yeah where it was like exploding i know there's another side i know adam well. knows this saying but like you know how in in fighting there's that saying the most dangerous guy is the guy who has nothing to lose like the huge underdog <laughs> It it almost seems like England, like from what you're saying, Giffen learned that lesson almost, and they just gave the underdog a bit more. Oh. He, he was like a bit no. more conservative in the fight. You oh. know? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a hundred hole. Like you guys can keep talking about. I want to pull something up. Well, I, I actually was going to just kind of comment on something very similar to what you just said, Jordan. Oh, okay. Where it it just seems like giving your example of you know, someone coming home to like play Xbox, um, might order Chinese food. Marx doesn't describe a character like that. Like he keeps describing a subsistence wage character who has no property. Yeah. He's property less and just earns enough to continue to exist. In he doesn't order even to have an yeah. Exactly. Yeah, like, kind of a, I think I might want to, this might be a clarifying point, but whenever he says property, I think he's kind of referring to industrial property, right? Like property, which produces not necessarily like, I own a like a, a baseball, 
Like, fair he, enough. Yeah, fair enough. But he does, it's, it's an observation. Adam's, he does paint Adam's picture a bit. He, he's no, almost no, he's like picturing... 100 does. I just wanted to clarify that specific point. <laughs> no, no. He, give, he, give me, he, your... he imagines people like they get barely enough money to get like the, you know, the the soiling green sh- like tube into their throat, and then they get back <laughs> the next day. Like he does paint that picture, and he says yes. it's inevitable. No, no, you're totally right. I, I used the property wrong there. Yeah. Um, but but he does describe subsistence wages. Oh, where where the the situation Jordan described, it's like you're you're you're, you're above subsistence. You know, yeah. like you have you have some quality of life. Mm. Yeah, and you, bad, ima- but... and you can imagine. You can even imagine like non-existent. Even like those like kind of ridiculously unlikely, but still technically possible scenarios where like if you're like super frugal and efficient, like minded, you can actually kind of rise through that system. Like because you, you're not like literally. It's not impossible to save. It's just less than likely, right? Yes. Like you could, and, and you're not and literally also, barely getting enough nutrients to survive. And he also seemed like he overlooked the fact that that dream would just be pumped into people. And if you want to do a conspiratorial view of that, you could almost just say in order to prevent revolution. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the idea that you're just a millionaire in waiting, you know, like every Republican voter who understands the tax code is essentially falling for that right like well i'm not a millionaire yet but i don't want the tax rate to be high once i get there no it's just like (laughs) so this actually draws back this is the point i wanted to make the promise of wealth it's everything it just keeps the system going (laughs) yeah one psychologically yes even if you know that there's a slim chance if it's physically possible then like it's not you know you're not going to be critiqued um, this is kind of something that is brought up a lot in discussions about like home ownership and like segregation. If you have soft segregation where like there's like one black guy in the neighborhood, like you can you internalize the fact that it's possible, right? So you won't complain, even if it's like never gonna be more than one, right? Mm-hmm. So like that psychologically seems very, very true. And your point about like preventing revolution <laughs> is also one hundred percent true. So we you know, we obviously are all familiar with the idea of universal health care. And the origins of the system, like the, the modern system, is in Germany in like the 1880s with Otto von Bismarck, like the most conservative figure yeah. in like European history. And it was basically just a cold calculation. It's like, if we give them this, you'll prevent revolution. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, Marx failed to see like that self-interest, even from like the ruling class. It could, and, it, yeah. and, you know, in a, in a you can view that in a dark or more of a like a light way. You can either yeah. view that as like, you know, capitalism actually is in some like literally subsistent wage driven thing, or you can view that as like, you know, preventative for like the development of like the next mode of production, which is more moral. It's also like, like yeah, Mark, Mark seems to like almost like imagine like a ruling class, like in the United States, you know what I mean? That <laughs> like, that, that actually just like, doesn't give a crap. Like no matter how yes. bad the conditions get, it's yeah. just like, like people are like, you know, like, could we get universal health care? And like, like, like the no. ruling class, <laughs> no, but no, no, like worse than that, the ruling class is trying to like, you know, pull back the things they do have. You know what it's I mean? Just like social security and stuff like that. It's, it's just true. like, it's they're true. actively working toward their own demise in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Where he doesn't give them like, you know, certain nations, like enough, you know, savvy credit in a sense. Yeah. For like, for like, okay, here are some reforms we can make in order to continue to perpetuate this system. So it's also, and this was my last thought before we move to the positive proposal. It's almost like Marx doesn't realize or the picture he paints doesn't include a middle class. And I wonder if that's also a really big reason why we haven't seen that kind of prophecy come to fruition uh, where I don't know. It's like, because look, if you're, if you're, you know, if you're that pauper that he imagines, you're never going to become just like, you know, like the, the, the factory owner. And people probably know that. But, but there is that dream of just becoming like kind of, you know, just like white suburbia, you know? Yeah, because like, that's, it's kind of like the distinction I made, like I commented earlier, it kind of relates to that, where like, yeah. you could technically be like, again, I don't, his, his definitions are a little shaky um, yeah. and they might change over time. But like, if you like don't own any of the productive, like, property right like you don't own any factory or something but like you have like enough inroads into like the more personal like aspects of like property it's like you know maybe maybe a home would like you be considered like yeah. enough it's like not you're not like producing anything but it's mm. like an inroad enough towards that end it's like you have some sort of capital right um so it's like he did he yeah he totally saw like it, it is like impossibility like 
it's like you either like go to like you know the the the, the darkest like most evil calculation of like how many calories <laughs> how many calories does the person need and i'll yeah. give them no more than like a single one more yeah. than like, <laughs> like he imagined that like and it's going down he doesn't really imagine yeah. that kind of ca- like class of people where like they don't really own any means of production but they can mm. actually like get a pretty fulfilling life i mean in the best cases well well i, I this was a, this made me think back to the estranged labor point again where it's like okay Think of some just objectively incredibly wealthy person like Bloomberg or Trump or someone, right? Yeah. yeah. They actually can't see the difference between a great middle class life and a really poor life. (laughs) They actually can't see that distinction, right? I mean, it's like they're kind of squinting. They're seeing that one house is smaller than the other, but like, (laughs) (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, but but I've got factories, (laughs) (laughs) you know? But so, so from that perspective, I almost wonder if, I don't know, but then from, but then from the perspective of someone who is objectively poor, like if you're making $25,000 a year and you look at someone who just has a great middle-class life, a family income of like $110,000 or something, you're like, that's amazing. And I could maybe get there somehow. Like most of us won't, but maybe I will. And it's like, exactly. Cause yeah, I mean, it ties back to the conception of like the class where he's laying out like in he in like the broad sense, like both of those people might technically be like it's assuming that the they don't they're not self-employed, like the wealthier case, like the, mm. you know, 110 a year. Like if they're just like a really like good, skilled, like worker, you know, don't own the means of their production. Right. Mm. Like <laughs> Mark kind of views them as like the same. He, it's like he, almost... he, doesn't, he doesn't have like the capacity to distinguish. He doesn't have the resolution. It's almost like he didn't really get that Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. Most men lead, lead lives of quiet desperation. That's just the, what the middle class is. He, he, almost, he almost thought that all lives of desperation were going to be loud and pauperous ones. He kind of forgot that people can live lives of quiet desperation, I feel like. Yeah. And that, that just really reminded me of the estranged labor point where it's like, I don't know, just look at like the people of our parents' generation in large part. Right. I mean, yeah, that's, no, it's a, that's good, a that's a pretty quiet and pretty desperate life. Yeah, I don't know. I just to make a quick side note before we move on, perhaps. Yeah. But um, you can definitely see where like the idea of alienation persisted. I don't remember exactly mm-hmm. when Estranged Labor was written. It was like one of the Paris manuscripts, I think. So it was like I thought it was written at, before this in 84. It was, <clears throat> 80, 84. I, I thought that was strange. Wait, what I'm was sorry. 1844. 1844. 1844. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't yeah, sure yeah, if you yeah. meant the direction was wrong. No, yeah. I, so, I missed, yeah. Estranged Labor was definitely written before this. Oh. Okay. And I'm saying like and you it was very definitely clearly, 1844. He was okay. He was still like on that kind of streak. Like it is the alienation does permeate through this work. Yes. That's all I wanted to say is like it's yeah. here and it's presented better, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. I think he definitely connects it to the political theory better in this. But um, uh, yeah, at the very least, yeah. All right, okay, so let's, on. yeah, because I want to talk about his positive proposals because I don't know, I, almost with the estranged labor again, it's like I kind of saw a, a lot. I was very amenable to his uh, laying forth of the problems. But again, I didn't understand how his solution really aimed to solve a lot of those problems while maintaining, I don't know, their benefits, right? So, okay. I, 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 I don't even have, I'm, I'm not even sure because it's like, to be honest, I didn't understand what he was saying here in large part because he talked about like the abolition of property, but then he kind of backed off of that. But then he was like, it's all property. But then he kind of backed off of that. I, I don't know what he's advocating for, to be honest, at this point. In part, I think my comments earlier about distinguishing like the types of property is what he's trying to get at here. Okay. Like he's basically, so in the first, we're looking at just the first page, which yeah. doesn't actually have a number. Um, 20, it would be 22, 22. Um, but um, basically he's like laying out, he's basically predicting like what the reader, like maybe even a sympathetic reader might like, like ha- hold reservations about, like mm-hmm. especially like towards the bottom of the page um, where it's, someone is like this is the second to last paragraph um Mm. hard won self-acquired self-earned property do you mean the property of petty artisan and of the small peasant the form of property that preceded the bourgeois form like this is what someone Mm. who's reading this would say like 
you're going to, you know, eliminate that, like yeah. my self-earned property. And then he kind of clarifies like only the mm. property like that is bourgeois, which is to yes. say like, you know, the private property that relates to production. Yes. That's okay. kind of what he's trying to clarify is like, if you're, you're, if you're like, especially if you're dis- um, dispossessed like artisan which is he actually addresses specifically mm. like you imagine like your tools like your you know your workbench mm. like you know your your don't take my tools <laughs> no i mean seriously <laughs> though like like they, they're already dispossessed because like a factory yes. can produce like twenty thousand pins when the pin maker produces two a day like mm. they're already concerned about that and they're like looking for solutions like this is, seems to be sort of sympathetic but you know clearly the communist rhetoric was already you know everyone was a communist at this point so he basically lays out like it is not like your tools that I will be confiscating. Um, it is like yes. the bourgeois property that you know is productive. Mm. Um, that or that is you know rel- important to the uh, means mm-hmm. of production. Mm-hmm. So that's like so, at least so, the first. So what's, I guess I guess with that one though, I can you clarify a little further on that? Like, how does he? I mean, I don't know if you would know this, but how does he actually distinguish between like? when the uh you know an artist begins to sort of become part of like the bourgeois and that and you know because like you can imagine become small sh- you can imagine oh, here's just my perspective like you can imagine like you know an artisan maybe employs you know three craftsmen right mm. pretty small you wouldn't really consider him bourgeois per se but okay um are, so you're not going to a you know kind of socialize his property but what about it? You know, maybe ten. You know, you, so, once yeah. you utilize, you know, machinery at that point. What's important to realize is that the artisanal form, like the, we're talking about craftsmen, like masters, guilds, that is not the bourgeois system, right? This is the previous mode. This is the feudal. You know, the people who you be addressing here are like the dregs of the feudalistic system in continental Europe. These are like in the system, like the master doesn't own the mean like doesn't own the production of like people under him it's just it's like a situation like a kind of i'm I'm imagining like a guild situation but like if if like the apprentice produces like um you know a sword it's like there's a a relationship between the two obviously but like the sword is you know isn't the master's property in the same way that like you Mm. know if i'm on an assembly line and i like drive nails into you know whatever all day like you don't own anything there right like it is that's the estrangement and there's less estrangement in the artisanal case so whenever he's talking about like addressing these people he's he's addressing people's like you know the the political situation has changed um these people have been dispossessed by both like the productive forces and like the political institutions shifting towards a notion of private property um, and they they were never really bourgeois. They could had the potential to become it if they kind of adopt some of the form, right? If they turn their little like, you know, craftsman workshop into a factory, you know, even if it's like a small scale kind of thing, you can imagine, you know, like you are the one who hammers like, you know, the sword when you pull it out of the forge, right? Mm-hmm. It's like in that case, like he would become bourgeois because the sword is his property, right? Like it, he kind of adopts the form. But in this case, like, the dispossessed artisans are actually like one of the primary audiences, which is why he addresses it here, because they they found themselves like going from like a kind of well off kind of protected class and just thrown into the like the the ocean of you know capitalistic forces, mm. realizing Seems- that they, they weren't they didn't take advantage of the notion of private property in the same way. So you you kind of interpret Marx here that um anyone is bourgeois and I, I don't want to say like, you know, speak too broadly here, but you're kind of reading it that anyone who's bourgeois is someone that exploits another's labor. I mean, yeah. And, 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 my own, and own, it owns their means of production. Like if you're, yeah, right. that if, you're is like, if you're in that position, you're, you're part of the bourgeois class. Exactly. You are a property owner where property refers to like relative to production. And if you own that, that means you're going to be owning the mm. end product of whatever like individual division of labor that anyone underneath you contributes. Right. So that's kind of like, that's my understanding currently. And now it could be, you know, slightly off or way off, but like, that's my understanding is like, you're part of the bourgeois. If you are like the productive property owner. Right. And like can... these dispossessed artisans are his prime target because they, they feel the loss of their stature and like 
it, their form of production doesn't gel anymore. Because yeah. he contrasts it right with the next sentence where, where people means, or people say, or do you mean the modern bourgeois private property? Exactly. And then he responds, but what does wage labor create? Uh, but does wage labor create any property for the laborer? Not a bit. It creates capital, i.e. that kind of property which exploits wage labor and which cannot increase except upon condition of beginning a new supply of wage labor for fresh exploitation. So I think if you meet that condition, then you're considered the bourgeois. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I actually, I just had a funny, I was like, that's actually true next to it when he asked, but does wage labor create any property for the laborer? Not a bit. I was like, that's actually, that's actually true. No, that's exactly it. And that's kind of like where I took it as more of like a definition for him, right? It's like, yeah. if you, if you know, the, the contrast that I laid out between like the artisan little like workshop and like yeah. a factory is that like, you might have like that sword, like you just like were kind of guided by the master in the first case. The second mm. one, you, you hammered the, you know, you hammered the sword. Yeah, you and, just and like you, you get like the the slop, <laughs> so you can yeah. come back in and and, and hammer hammer the sword the next day. <laughs> it's, it, it's actually crazy too, because it's like, oh, he's actually right about like this subsistence living almost. I mean, like you go into work, you do this very specialized, very estranged task, and then you get enough money to live just a very comfortable lifestyle, but not comfortable enough that you can't be ob obliged to come in the next day and still do it. I don't know that I was like, oh, shit. he's actually kind of right there. Like, I just know he's I, I do find right like 100 percent yeah. right where he says like not a bit. It's like, yeah, and not a bit. Yeah, like really not a bit. Um, OK, so the, on the next page, 23, mm -hmm. he says, let us now take wage labor. The average price of wage labor is the minimum wage, i.e. that quantum of the means of subsistence, which is absolutely requisite to keep the laborer in bare existence as a laborer. Okay, so like yeah, exactly. I just said, yeah. So he continues, uh, what therefore the wage laborer appropriates by means of his labor merely suffices to prolong and reproduce a bare existence. And this is what we were talking about before with he's, he's almost imagining like too low a floor for reality. Uh, yeah. And he continues, we by no means intend to abolish this personal appropriation of the productions of labor, an appropriation that is made for the maintenance and reproduction of human life, and that leaves no surplus wherewith to command the labor of others. All that we want to do away with is the miserable character of this appropriation under which the laborer lives merely to increase capital and is allowed to live only insofar as the interest of the ruling class required it. Okay, what is he saying with that last part? Because he's saying, we want to deal away with the miserable character of that appropriation under which you, you just, you exist in that recurring cycle. Like I just said, you only make enough so that you have to come back the next day, but you're able to have a, a comfortable enough life that you don't revolt. Yeah. So basically, so there's the key line is, we by no means intend to abolish yes. this personal appropriation of the products of labor, right? So you're imagining this would be like the sword the example. He's yeah, he's still yeah, you know, he's still addressing the artisan. He's like, if you've heard that communists are going to take your sword, it's like no, yes. it's yes. only the aspect of like the labor that has been appropriated from you. Mm -hmm. Like you get it back. It's not like it's being taken again. Okay, now, so is it materialized physically is different, but. Yeah, so what is he actually what is he saying in the positive dimension then is he is he actually advocating that we just go back to like the craftsman age no okay he's so what, what is he saying there so he is basically imagining oh, he hasn't put like laid down a, an overly yeah. positive like claim of what it would look like he's saying the next stage will have the productive capacity that we have. We can't go back in productive capacity and sure. going back to artisans. That it's absurd. It right? would just destroy like, everything. Yeah. Once you realize that like a pin factory can produce 10,000 pins a day and a pin maker can produce two, you cannot go back. He's imagining you keep that productive capacity, but you remove this kind of bourgeois property. To it. Exactly. You remove the estrangement. Okay. And he's saying to the artisan, like you will not have like your, you know, the product of your labor estranged from you anymore, but you will still like, there will still be, you know, productive forces. It's kind of like underlying that. Okay. I'm very interested in how he thinks we can do that. <laughs> well, We're well, all it's, interested it's, in that. Yeah. Well, it's his collective ownership that he gets into. Yeah. Which where... I guess I, 
I, I want to talk about that because I did not understand how that was supposed to do away with the estrangement. But but I don't know about the estrangement. Yeah, so but... he isn't that the miserable labor of the appropriation? I mean, I, yeah, yeah I mean, but I, I think the idea there is that if people are collecting equally, you know, from the production overall, mm-hmm. like you still are like like you know appropriating the production of your work you know, maybe Mm -hmm. a little more indirectly in the sense that like, let's say you're producing boots yeah, and you know um, the boots collectively are owned by the people who produce them and you get whatever, you know, equal cut of the boots once they're sold. I mean, it might not be the boot you made that gets sold for the money that you're given. Mm -hmm. Right. But collectively you're part of that system. So yeah. Can we move on to the next page? I think it has like, it's Let's getting play. there. Can we also skip the part about the the family? I just didn't think that was that interesting. Unless well, um, you guys where's, did. I'm sorry, where's the family? Is that hey, 23 still? If, no, no, I'm sorry, it's 24. I was a page ahead of you. Oh, no, I, I, I want to go to 24. I just don't know where the family exactly comes in. Oh, it's it's like 24. I was like abolition of the family. Like, I, this, this oh, is yeah, not... no, we don't need to address that. Okay. Oh, no, it's like kind of in the middle bottom. I see. Have you seen that uh, there's a guy out in California who um, I think it was in the get the name of the san francisco paper but it might be the san francisco chronicle he just uh published an article which might have been a week and a half ago arguing for um universal you know um orphanage so that i've seen it wasn't that paper but i've seen an advocation for something very similar to that uh, yeah i mean i i thought it was worth noting just because like it's now yeah. being published in major papers like he's, yeah that's interesting yeah you're yeah, right so he's, there, he's there was a popular that. philosophy piece about that uh, uh eh, i didn't uh, the only yeah, reason no. why i just didn't think it was that germane to like this conversation yeah, to me know? it was yeah, kind yeah, of more of a political statement like addressing the concerns of the audience which we so don't it, have those it, concerns so it's it, like, exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> Like I'm, my biggest horror isn't that like some abstraction of the family is going to be lost here, right? Like, sure, sure. We, we have like you know 150 years of history after this. Um, but what I wanted to uh, draw to is like the second paragraph in 24. Um, communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is to deprive him of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriations. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like we're kind of addressing like what he means. Like what he's trying to get at, like what is mm. it? What is he talking about, and what is he mm-hmm. not talking about? Mm-hmm. As we were talking about just briefly, so that was kind of the conclusion of that point. Um, I had the next two sentences highlighted. He yeah, says it has been objected that upon the ab- abolition of private property, all work will cease and universal laziness will overtake us. Mm-hmm. And then he begins to respond. According to this, bourgeois society ought long ago to have gone to the dogs through sheer idleness, for those of its members who work acquire nothing, and those who acquire anything do not work. Um, Yeah, it was a clever point, but I I actually don't know that he addressed like that kind of seemingly legitimate concern of like the, yeah, I don't don't know, because it's like, okay, look, here's where I'm at right now with this. All the problems he points out are right, like both from a strange labor and this, but I don't know. It's also like, ah, I kind of like having, you know, like companies produce pharmaceuticals that are relatively cheap. Like I kind of like having clothes that are relatively cheap, but nice. Yeah. We like, kind of like all these things. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. No, do, doesn't the incentive, cause, cause right. Like here's, here's the problem. The incentive structure is a farce. No one is actually going to, or the vast majority of people aren't going to work their way out of that pauperism right even relative pauperism but don't we kind of need them to believe that in order to work like i, I don't know this, this is I, all I very it, paradoxical it, isn't he still talking about private property in the sense of though like capital in that sense though because he already said earlier mm-hmm. that he is not talking about like property that one might own yes. he's talking about so but, so in that I'm case about your hammer yeah yeah so so in this case right here so he's saying he's people saying, could still get rich but they wouldn't be able to like own means of production yeah, so like according to this, so bourgeois society, so so capital owners mm-hmm. ought long ago to have gone to the dogs through sheer idleness. Mm-hmm. So the workers they acquire no property to increase production. Yes. And those who acquire anything, so the bourgeois, um, so those who acquire property in order to uh, you know further production 
they do not work. Um, it's not entirely true either. Of yeah, course, yeah. It, they, they, yeah. He they, imagines they, like someone who literally sits in a chair and just watches, like just, just watches reaps the, the literally, stocks. Yeah. Literally <laughs> reaps the benefits. Exactly. <laughs> like the reality <laughs> is, is like if you're the owner, you're going to be working. Mm. It's just that, like that's the thing is like he has he makes very large untrue assumptions about like what it is. Now, were they true at the time? Perhaps sometimes, perhaps he could have come up with like a legitimate example. Like, you know, th- this is like the rent seeker. Like if you own property, like you, you can actually just sit down, like, like land. I mean, by property mm. in this case, like you can literally just sit and watch the benefits be reaped. Like someone yes. pays you money to like, you know, rent the land. You can literally just stare at the wall and you just become wealthy if you have yeah. enough of it. Right. Yeah. He's imagining that in all cases of kind of production where in the reality we can imagine like the busy, like the super busy CEO, like the, the kind of almost like just go into completely... his office. He's just staring at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, don't interrupt. <laughs> Aggressive. Yeah. So like, that's another, you know, instance where he either didn't foresee or he was willingly um, kind of ignorant to the reality. Yeah, he, he really does imagine the guy like the factory who's just like behind the door he's, like just open up his office he's just, like get back to work <laughs> or just like or, or like the classic quote like back to the mines exactly okay do we have any more oh yeah go ahead i have a question okay mm-hmm. so people are allowed to become p- people are allowed to to increase their private property not means of production under under what he's proposing correct so like you can own like you will own the product of your own labor and like the means of that he's suggesting like it's not that you won't own anything he's not taking away the artisan's hammer he's taking away your ability to get you know the other like the person under you's sword that he like was not produced by you I, again, I guess, I'm trying to say uh, this analogy, but he's he's the re, the reality is he's not like specific enough. Like we have I like genuinely legitimate don't concern. understand. Here, here's my problem. Like I I understand what he's saying theoretically. If you're like, put the like if if you were like okay, put what Marx is saying into even like the most generalized policy prescriptions. I have no idea what what to do there because like everything that I would do based on this conclusion, he attacks as being that like petty petty socialism or whatever like to, yeah like, you know just re- like re- re- redistribution reformer. yeah yeah, yeah so but, but, i don't but, understand I, what well, he's saying well people I mean, i'll just give you what people are saying today right like people sure. are advocating for co-ops which they think yes. is like yes. you know a producer um, co-ops yeah or yeah so actually. so, it's, so I, I don't know too much about them but i yeah. from what i've kind of gleaned at this point mm-hmm. you know individuals are part owners in the company so mm-hmm. uh, who do and, the laboring? And, yes. And, in the case of the you know, um, producer co-op. Wait, Adam, yeah, I do know a little bit about this. R- sorry, real quick. On. Is it essentially, it, it, is it almost like the difference between the Green Bay Packers ownership and the rest of the NFL's ownership? Yes. I would say it's very similar to that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm understanding this correctly, it does seem like, doesn't that okay that that seems to me like that either entails the keeping of the estrangement it's just you make a lot more money because you also own you know stock in the company or doesn't it entail like a real real loss of productivity like (laughs) co-ops just don't that's the thing he's saying that it will be this way without actually and to be fair this is like a political document so he's trying Mm -hmm. to draw in supporters right Mm -hmm. but the reality is you're 100 right like it's hard for us to imagine like keeping the productivity without like the estrangement because even then like it what he's kind of getting at like the the modern example of the co-op it's still kind of an an abstraction because there is a division of labor it's you the have division to. Yeah. with any division of labor, which is kind of the, and I don't know if he recognized that at this point, he might've still um, got it backwards from Smith. Um, I don't know whether this like Mark's writing this thought that it was like the um, private property underwriting all this yet, which I think it is, or if it was like the um, uh, division of labor. Cause Smith says basically once you recognize the division of labor that's where the kind of the productive forces can come into play yeah that, and that, marx marx is yeah. like trying to basically say like the estrangement that you know implicitly is coming from the division of labor can be abstracted away See, um, uh, but with the productive productivity uh, can remain and it's like it's very hard uh, to imagine that because like if you're 
in a system with division of labor, there's going to be some en- estrangement only if it's because like, it's hard to abstract the concept of your production. Even if it's just like yeah. just you, it's very difficult to do that. Or in a system that doesn't have division of labor, you don't have productivity. Yes. You're, you're back to like yeah. you know, the, the, the lone man, like just, you know, sheer, you make your, you grow your own wheat, you grind your own grain. Like, in which case, why is it even a company at that it, point? Almost. It's at like, that point, well, no, I'm, at that I'm point, just, there's I'm, not a society. <laughs> like, I mean, well, I mean, yeah. like, I'm just wondering though, like co-ops do exist, right? A hundred percent. Yeah. Multiple and, kinds. And, and, and people are largely pretty happy in co-ops and there are some that yes. have existed for decades, right? So they can Absolutely. be productive, right? Oh, well, they can I be didn't, productive. Oh, yeah, the, yeah. the question is whether they can be like productivity, which more you switch is competing. All industry yeah, to compete co-ops, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. the the kind of system where you can imagine co-ops working, I'm a little bit more familiar with consumer co-ops actually, where like the people who like purchase, like imagine a grocery store con- mm-hmm. consumer co-op, right? You become a part owner, um, and you can kind of have some say, like, you know, in the form of a vote or whatever, yeah. about like what things are grown or bought and mm-hmm. like supplied at the store, um, like. Yeah, like that, but it, it's only going to really work again. Like, you can't reach the same productivity as like modern capitalism. Or if you do, only it's a niche. The estrangement is still there. Yeah, exactly. Like, right, you can't yeah. have, you can't like solve both problems: the productive problem and the estrangement problem. It's like the, we can get like these kind of co-ops, and they they're actually very interesting economic topics. So I know a little bit about it, but not mm-hmm. not as much as to satisfy you guys, I'm sure. But like you can't like it can operate in like a niche of like kind of like imagine like a kind of no like chemical free vegan kind of um boutique almost grocer right you can actually get a co-op like structure working really well in that case right you have like a very like people genuinely interested in like the product that they're getting it's like but you can't get that model to work over the scale of a modern city, it's absurd. I Even almost feel like it relies absurd. on capitalism being the underlying. It's <laughs> almost like parasitic on it because it's like, oh, you actually need people who are just like you kind wealthy. of need. Well, but, but both yeah. wealthy, but also like that that middle class popper almost. You know hundred I mean? percent. You need the middle class popper, the one who has like money to spare and like time to dedicate towards like making decisions about like whether they want asparagus or brussels sprouts like yeah <laughs> this is why i'm honestly like i'm i would describe myself right now as like a paradoxicalist about marx because <laughs> because because like everything just terminates in a paradox honestly with this because it's like okay is the state of the world good no is any proposed way of solving it better no like what what should we do? I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, can we get to this candy land where he describes where you can get like you know division of labor with no alienation, enormous productive capacities without any notion of private property? Like it's so hard to imagine. And it is so tempting to imagine. Like it's a million like you can again, this is a political document first and foremost. So you can like it's it's entailed by that is the fact that he's not going into like the theory, you know, right? He wrote like capital like a an enormous tome where he puts theory but like like it it invokes sentiments but serious inquisition just it's it not very satisfying it, it, it is also, paradoxical on multiple ends this also begins to conjure up aspects of like plato's noble lie also where it's like the, the entire <laughs> yeah, thing, so- the entire thing is kind of a facade but because it's a facade it works like you're referring to like Marx's proposals or like our capitalistic system, uh, uh, our capitalistic system. So his observation. Thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. His it's like, oh, actually, you are just going to live and die, like just ground up in the gears of like this for this system. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like only through that. Can you even have that miserable? life? <laughs> yeah. I mean, the reality it's it really kind of does. It is. I mean, even just discussing this paper actually made me see how crucial like the kind of Hegelian philosophy is to this. It's like you have to kind of presuppose this grand arc, this kind of like we're going towards the something, right? Whatever that is. And with like without it, it falls to pieces. Because if you kind of just kind of view the world as like, you know, we're born into a place with no guidance, you know, it, there's no nothing preventing like even enormous shittiness like crashing upon us at any moment. It's like we've constructed a system which, you know, it's better than viable, like any alternative, right? Yeah. I mean, we we aren't manifesting the most efficient version of that, especially in the US. But like, 
or do we get enormous productivity? Do we get like a like a poverty that actually changes and betters itself, even if it's still poverty? Like kind of, yeah. Honestly, gun to my head right now, if you're like, okay, you're philosopher king, you have to change the system in some way. It, it, like Marx would be so disappointed in me because I'm still just going to be like social democracy. <laughs> oh, he hates the social democrats. I know he hates them, <laughs> but but I don't understand how like, it just seems like right now that's our best idea of like what a good compromise is. Because I, I, I don't know, like I don't understand how Marx, and he never addresses it is. this. He doesn't yeah. agree. He doesn't agree with like compromise in that sense. That's the thing. It's like, if, yeah. if you still, if you still live in a system, and this is where I actually, um, I was thinking about this, Jordan, your, some of your claims earlier, um, you remember describing like the idea of the, the f- academic philosopher. It's kind of like you kind of get rid of the alienation, right? Yeah. From majority. Yeah. Marx, I think would actually say to that, like at least um, 47 Marx, like you simply have like come to accept your chains. You found bliss with your chains still on because like you don't own because you're underneath still that system, right? Mm. I mean, it's still you still in an abstract kind of product producing, but you still are underneath like owners, even if it's like a board of directors. Like he says, like whatever, like satisfaction you get is the satisfaction of a slave in his chain. And I'm not joking. Like this is not my no, no, like, 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 He literally would tell is... you that to his face. I'm pretty sure. No, no. But the, the thing that I was laughing at is like, oh no, you've just like justified Jordan Peterson's entire existence, where he's like. <laughs> <laughs> he's, like this, he's just this like philosopher who's underneath no one just like making spurious claims and misquoting people <laughs> and, and marx would be like that is the theme. like the non-estranged person in its entirety <laughs> the only true man <laughs> yeah I'm, I, but i'm sorry it's just i no, couldn't help but laugh at that. no 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 I, I totally agree but yeah that Again, we, you can I'm disagree like, about oh, whether Marx no. would agree with that claim, but I do think that that's what he would say is like, yeah, there is no compromise because the alienation is still there. The injustice of the appropriation of labor is still there, but it's just mm-hmm. impossible for us to imagine like the same productivity. Like imagine yeah, like you yeah, just yeah. don't produce medicine anymore. It's like that's a oh, hell upon hell. Yeah. And it's also like, dude, medicine, co- like pharmaceutical co-ops don't make any sense. It's like <laughs> each person's like artisanly making just <laughs> Like it doesn't make any sense. Is artisanal like um antibodies being produced? It's like it's no. like artisanal monoclonal antibodies being produced. <laughs> just writhing. Like, I, yeah. I think I think though, like I don't I still don't think that's exactly what Marx is like advocating for, like precisely. Like, I, I, well, I, the co-op I, is just a the only sure. rationalization you can possibly make with his no, but, like but, contradictions. But, that's what, but that's that's what that's what I mean though. Like I but but even the co-op, like you're not imagining that, like, you know, every single person is like, you know, <laughs> of course, it's like, you know, it's, it's, like, a strong it's not a group of right? artisans. <laughs> so, exactly. So, I mean, I think the idea, like, like the major critiques there would be like, um, I mean, what was the, uh, I'm kind of blanking at this hour at this point, but what was the uh, pharmaceutical company that was pumping out tons of Oxycontin? What was that again? I'm not sure. I, I, uh, I should know the name. There's a, there were a couple companies, but yeah, the, uh, the whole, well, it was one oh, major God. company. <laughs> I mean, like, what was your you, point with it? Well, you the point on. is like, okay. So in that system, right. You've got like a bunch of like hardworking scientists that are like, you know, developing methods to, you know, um, ultimately produce this drug, but you've got like a family making billions. Oh, it might've been yeah. like Merck actually. I think about it. Maybe not, but, but Regardless, either way, yeah, yeah. But, but you had like billions of dollars pretty much like going to like, you know, um, to like this family yeah. and you're like this higher up pretty much where, you know, you know, your boss's boss might make 300,000, like the family behind the pharmaceutical comp- company might make, you know, make a few billion dollars. It's like <laughs> the son you know, of that heir is ooh. definitely just sitting there reaping the benefits. But okay, yeah. here's my question. So, so, someone, like, yeah. so someone like, you know, who advocates for a co-op might say, okay, you know no family the, yeah 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 i mean it's just like in like the means of production at that point like that would largely be owned yes by the workers it would be owned by the scientists i have, I have a question then. And, mm-hmm. okay this might be a really stupid question i'm not seeing the way out of it but here here it is okay because i was thinking about that too and it's like okay so he's identified the problem like you just said of all of these people are doing actual work and then the majority of their profit just gets taken by the owning family right mm-hmm. okay nix the owning family 
And then their share of the company gets redistributed to the actual people of the company, right? Okay. I, okay. This is just my like intuition. So I don't, this could be a stupid question, but it's not, I'm sure. That seems to me like it's going to result in just the, as the company kind of profits, instead of the profits going to the, the people, the owners, it's going to go to the people of the company, right? Sure. Doesn't, doesn't that then, it's almost like that, that blows up that noble lie of like, of the part of capitalism that he said was so terrible, but it works, is that you pay people enough so that they can't really leave but they're not going to like revolt and they just come back the next day. If people are actually profiting in that way, isn't it going to like remove their incentive to actually kind of do the work w- work defined in the Birch and Russell episode where it was like stuff that you wouldn't, wouldn't do unless do. you, yeah. It, like d- doesn't it kind of bite its own tail in that sense? Um, I guess I'm not, I'm not sure I even understood that. I'm sorry. You, okay. I think I get what you're saying, but I was going to tie it to alienation. I, Thought you were going to do that, but you uh, didn't so that was the that's the other side of the coin. Of yeah, it. that's the coin I was predicting. You could go, well, go that, ahead. that I don't know how you get out of that problem either. But like, uh, okay, so okay, billions are going to like the owning families right now. Yeah, right. Sure. You change that, and then their share is evenly divided between the the people of the company. Right. Right. So then, as the, pro- the, the as the company profits, all of the individuals are going to profit, right? Mm-hmm. But everyone's still doing their same jobs. It kind of seems like. So the people who are doing shit jobs that they don't want to do, who are still estranged, if they're profiting, why wouldn't they just n- cease to work then? Well, here's the thing. This this so is what I was expecting. They're part to get of the through. company, right? Like they would need to continue working as part of the company to reap the profits of the company. But, uh, but, but what I'm saying is that if they're actually reaping the profits, I, I don't know. So, so maybe I guess the claim is that they just they wouldn't be reaping enough profits so that they could quit it's just like a like what what i'm saying is like if you don't like your job like if you don't if you wouldn't intrinsically do it yeah right because at the at the company yeah no, they still I, I gotta be just like a cleanup crew yeah. or something like I, for the you know i think sure. i can address your point okay um so you basically identify like the the cleanup crew that would be doing you know work in the burton russell sense right yeah in this system that seemingly addresses marx's problems right yeah Okay, so basically what I would say to that is it depends on like our the way we're using the term alienation, mm-hmm. right? Because that's kind of where he identifies the problem, right? It's like an artisanal But the thing janitor. is, like, he said, this is part of the last episode, one of the biggest problems I had with it <laughs> is you can imagine a, like, kind of colloquial sense of alienation that is still entailed by any, like, of the, you know, Bertrand-style work mm-hmm. or just, like, um, kind of just labor in general. But Marx is saying specifically, like his alienation is the estrangement of, like, primarily <sighs> your a a bait and switch. It, well, it's a bit of a bait and switch then, because he it either about, is yeah. or he doesn't. He's not clear enough with like which sure. what he's referring to. I mean, it's it probably both, like at times, right? Because it's yeah. a bit, again, it's a political doc. This specifically is a political document. It's easy to kind of say like invoke the alienation without kind of like strictly laying out that he means like you know between like the production like the product of labor and like the laborer yeah but like it, it, again it, it butts ag- accepting that then butts against the notion of like well the division of labor is still like alienating in a sense just mm. like not in like emotionally like socially it, it, just well, not it wouldn't be in the it, sense it wouldn't be alienating in terms of in terms of property but it would still be alienating in terms of this is not something that you kind of intrinsically want to do and right. you still don't seem like you would be able to kind of partake in the whole process then. Oh, yeah, no. So that yeah. if that's what he means by alienation, then it's inconsistent entirely. But mm-hmm. I think what he's saying is like he addresses like the problem of alienation as being that particular type of alienation. And so whenever he like solves the problem, like you can still imagine being in that scenario. It's like, well, it feels alienating in a you know casual sense, right? Like any division of labor is going to entail some sort of like abstraction okay. of like your labor right i have, and then, I have a question you can't swear it <laughs> okay you can wave a magic wand and <clears throat> uh change the structure of companies right now such that you actually do strip the like you know ownership the ownership of the means of production like the pure profiteering mm-hmm. split that evenly and then redistribute it in stock to all of the people working at the company 
Mm -hmm. that alone. So we're not going to change the productivity aspects of it. We're not going to change, you know, like the alienation aspects of it. Would you do that right now or not? Probably for a lot of companies. Yeah. Assuming yeah. productivity stays the same. Like that's the no, kind of that, my... well, that's, that's the big question. But oh, like, I thought that you were saying like that included, and I oh. thought your, your point was about the alienation. I mean, if, if the product, I was just saying like, everyone's doing the same jobs and everything. It's not like the, the, the nature of the jobs is changing. Oh, or anything like oh that. Then, yeah. then I can cite the lack of productivity as like my reason to deny. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you're able to, a hundred percent. I, I, okay, I mean, so you wouldn't so, do it then. No. And, and can okay. I clarify first? And, yeah. Yeah. Of course. Um, basically I think part of the, what is entailed by the kind of system is not only like reaping some of the profits, but also partial decision-making even democratically in a co-op, right? Like, and I think that is kind of where you get, like, it is very hard for me to imagine, like, there is a utility to the hierar hierarchy. Wait, but that's actually not entailed. I don't think that what entailed in my question was the democ democratic aspect of it, because you could still have someone actually making decisions for the company, like the okay. CEO, essentially. Okay. But they're not going to have like that kind of inflated uh, profit. Okay, so it's only yeah. the profit chain. Yeah. Okay, I see yeah. what you're saying. And is there, so there's still a pay differential. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Thanks for clarifying. That was good. Um, because I actually think the answer might be yes for a lot of companies for me too. Because I don't know that I would. It's okay. It My just depends on the company, right? I mean, just yeah. think of like, like the corruption we just talked about, like with pharmaceutical companies. It's yeah. like, I mean, clearly there were like perverse motives there. That just convinced like a family to you know to make billions. I, I just like do you think there would still be like that? I mean, I, I kind of viewed it, you know, um democratically from like at least my perspective when I said yes. But even where, if you weren't like, okay. Uh, no, but 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 yeah, let me yeah. finish this statement though. But like the way I kind of viewed it was like just you know, if you've got like ten thousand scientists working for like a pharmaceutical company. I would think they would have like a little more honor than somebody at the top who's yeah. just like sitting there to like reap profit has like no real, <laughs> has like no real understanding yes. of like the science at play or, you know, like the potential like health consequences, but are just these numbers. To, like, okay. yeah, yeah. So, so I think uh, like it, it would depend like on, on the company, obviously, of but, course. but yeah. yeah, for something like that, I can definitely imagine like, you know, yeah, yeah. That's because fair. I, I just don't know what the like honestly, if you think about it, like what the fuck are those people actually adding to society? K kind of not much. Like, wouldn't yes, it so wouldn't it actually be way better if just like everyone's lives were improved? <laughs> <laughs> kind of hard to deny no. that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like I pose that to you, what, Giffen. <laughs> what, <laughs> oh. Um, basically, I think my comment is what makes it difficult in that system is. If we're saying make some of like companies, you know, form that construct, then I think it kind of collapses because it's I very said, hard I to said imagine. Wave it and all of them would be. Adam said some. Okay, yeah, that's exactly the thing. It's like I think it is an all or nothing. I don't think. Oh, I mean, okay. I, I do. I can imagine like for some companies it could work, but I do see like, and for me, it's partly because it is work for a lot of these people. And like, if you're going to be less productive, less efficient in this system, which I do kind of think is likely, if not necessary, um, I do think then if you're going to be doing like work in the Russell sense, you're going to be doing the more profitable work, which means you're going to probably like if you're in the, one of the higher ups or like, you know, have some control, like in that sense, yeah. you're probably going to move to where you can get more money. If you're going to be doing like, you know, things you wouldn't do otherwise, like regardless, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it is an all or nothing. And I think between the all or the nothing, I choose the nothing. <laughs> Clip Giffen denies the poppers. <laughs> <laughs> just, just that, just the last clause there. I choose the nothing. <laughs> I choose the nothing. What do you mean by that? I chose the nothing already. Right. Chose the nothing. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah I, don't, I don't know if that was coherent, but that's kind of like my inclination, at least, to that question. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I think the logic follows that you that you put out there. I mean, I just wonder if like uh, you were able to do it, um, maybe it's like a specific industry because there would be like yeah. uh, less movement, that's true. Bet like between like individuals. Like, if you, oh, you know, that's if you're, a very good like, point. Actually, you know what yeah, I mean? Like, 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 yeah. based, like the pharmaceutical example. Like, it's not like you're going to be a scientist. Like, if you're skilled okay. labor, that works. If you're not skilled labor, if you're going to be like moving garbage cans, you can go to any industry, right? 
but for like the science. Wait, but wouldn't you actually want to be in the industry of of redistribution? Who's who's you? Yeah, the unskilled? unskilled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The unskilled. They're all going to flock to the uh, redistribution. Oh, companies, um, right? Pr- well, that depends on like because the profits that you reap. Because imagine in this case, like we've been talking about profits, but mm-hmm. you also reap the losses. You know, if you're not productive enough. Yeah. So in that I, case, what does it's that like even they entail? Be, like what? what that's I the mean, thing the is, company goes under, but like, I don't know. What does that like actually entail? Uh, it's one thing that's hard to imagine. Like, yeah, we have we are it, pretty well ingrained, like, to the notion of like kind of like a limited liability corporation, which kind of you know, yeah, comes from property. So it's like it's hard for <laughs> everyone. Just walks that. away clean from like the burning plane. <laughs> 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 that's exactly the point. Like, especially when it comes to anything that requires, and this is another thing that Mark didn't foresee is like the idea of skilled labor. Can you imagine everyone was just someone like you crank a wheel. Like there, there's no like yeah. intelligent like you know scientist, which is kind of abstracted in his world. It's yeah, like everyone's yeah. everyone's turning the dial, and if you can't turn the dial like the person to your left, you just die. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not joking. He says that. <laughs> <laughs> Only in so far as like the you know productive classes deem you worthy to live. Yeah. So, I I, I think we're sort of getting at the point of our productivity. Speaking of, at least I know I am. I yeah. yeah. I think that this, honestly, this for me is ending in a bit of aporia, you know, that Greek word for, for kind of confusion. I mean, if in a good way, though, I mean, if he, I understand Marx in a way that I think is, you know, productive, I still don't know entirely what I think about him, which is, you know, it's not a bad thing, but <laughs> I, w- I would, I would put a lot of claim in the stake or the stake in the claim that if you've listened to this, you understand Marx better than Peterson does. <laughs> oh, but by our first comment, we had s- surpassed him. Imagine thinking that, you know, he, in that, in that video that I sent you guys, that debate, he was like, there's not, he was like, I've, I haven't read a book less intelligible than this or something like he had like, come on, man. Like, where's the charitability? Like, you don't have to agree with Marx, but like, really you haven't read a text that's riddled with more falsehoods or whatever this like come on no it's impossible like (laughs) you're not being intellectually honest like we sat down and we just like you know looked at inferences that we could make we looked at you know assumptions that he made that we disagree with or contradictions or paradoxes like that was where we got it not like ideas are mostly wrong they're more (laughs) (laughs) and and, and like worst of all was like the context of that because like you know that he was like discussing with like zizek right yeah yeah but so like it was a discussion of like marxism and there's been like you know 160 180 years now of like you know uh literature since like this pamphlet was published and like if instead it's a political pamphlet mm, so it's called so, arms yeah so it's pretty funny like when debating like an economic system <laughs> like in a political system of like there's been like development like you know 200 years worth of literature you arrive with like a political pamphlet having read it and it's just like <laughs> dude you shouldn't be on this stage what's wrong with you <laughs> yes. it's it's, it's yeah. almost like uh discussing like the reactive attitudes or no, no, even worse than that. It's almost like discussing like restorative justice, but then only having read like a <laughs> Christie paper. <laughs> you show exactly up and it's, just, it. and it, yes. it's like, yeah, but yeah, there's, I mean, it's like, there's no dogmatism. Like, he's not the final word. Like, it's the ideas that like are carried through exactly. Like, you can yeah. read, you can read a paper published in 2022, which entails some particular like yeah. niche or aspect. Um, and you know, you can't just. <laughs> Pull up conflict as property <laughs> and no. make like ridiculous claims. It also like betrays a- his motives too. His motives were to smear and win the fight, not not to actually just engage in the argument. Yeah, not even in the, the attack the psychology of Marx and Engels. Like he literally argued from the ad hominem. He's like, oh, just just to, ask. Uh, <laughs> truly, truly. <laughs> Truly. All right. Well, let's let's formally wrap this episode up. Um, I don't think we'll have any. I don't, I don't think that our. I don't think that this podcast garners a lot of Peterson fandom, but we've surely eschewed it. <laughs> this Two non-overlapping circles at this point. If it was ever here, yeah. Um, all right. Well, tune in next time for unknown. Whatever we'll be talking about. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of Plato's Cave. Um, I always enjoy discussing topics with uh, with these two guys. So if you want to um, support the show in any way, you can do so simply by sharing it. Uh, I'm hoping to get this show out to more people. Uh, and so if you want to share it on Twitter or social media, that would really help me. Uh, you can also rate it on Apple Podcasts. Uh, like this video if you're watching on YouTube, or subscribe uh, via Apple Podcasts or an RSS feed. Uh, you can also discuss it on your own show and link back uh, to my website, or you can connect me uh, with recommended guests or topics to cover. Uh, you can get in contact with me at Plato's Cave Podcast at gmail.com, follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore C underscore Myers, and I now have a website for my philosophy endeavors at jordanmyers.org. If you want to know a little bit more about me and my fellow co-hosts, um, as I said in the introduction, I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Houston. I did my undergrad at the University of Pittsburgh, where I studied mechanical engineering and philosophy. And now that I'm back at school, I'm hoping to more closely study uh, moral responsibility, free will, ethics, epistemology, and moral psychology. Those are topics that I was uh, introduced to and got really interested in in my undergrad work. So uh, Adam and Giffen accompanied me on this show, and Adam is uh, one of my oldest friends. We actually met in kindergarten, um, and we've been interested in philosophical topics for as long as we can remember, and in a lot of ways, it's been the basis of our friendship. Uh, Adam studied chemistry and biology at Cornell, and he is currently working at a law firm. Um, and he's especially interested in moral responsibility as well, but also law, religion, and free will. Uh, Giffen is also one of my oldest friends, and uh, we've been friends since elementary school as well. Um, Giffen studied biology and economics at RPI, and now he works in human health research. Uh, he believes that there's very interesting overlap between both of his fields of study and philosophy, and he's particularly interested in exploring political philosophy. So this series was right up his alley. Um, and with, uh, with all of that information, Again, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this episode, and I hope that you get in contact with me or, or follow my work in any way that you uh, deem reasonable to do. So with that, thank you for listening.